Ever wonder what would happen if you got hit by a train? Here's some quick thoughts from an ER doc. If I took you and I strapped you on the hood of your car and I drove 70 miles an hour, you would be scared to death. So a baseball, if I'm sitting in my car and somebody throws a 55 mile an hour fastball at my, at my driver's side window and it hits my windshield, my window, the window's going to break. If a train, thousands of times the mass of that, of that baseball, hits me at the same speed, the energy is so much greater. That's what makes people 20 times more likely to die. The speed is the same, but the mass is what makes the energy so much worse. In motor vehicle collisions, whether it's involved with another car, whether it's involved with a train or a solid object, what happens is we have three phases of deceleration. If you're traveling 70 miles an hour and you slam into a train, the first thing that stops is that car. But the laws of physics, Newton's first law of physics says a body in motion or at rest tends to stay in motion or at rest until acted on by an outside force. And what that means is when that car comes to a stop, you're still traveling 70 miles an hour. Seatbelts and airbags are designed to make you stop at the same time that car stops. That helps you ride down the safety features of the car. Now the third phase of deceleration is the reason we can't save all the people that we like to save in automobile crashes and that's because your internal organs are still traveling 70 miles an hour. It only takes a split second to lose control of a vehicle. Tragically, at my level one trauma center, we had that happen not too long ago. Some young kids were driving down I-49 and just briefly were distracted and their front lock tires pulled off of the road. When they did, they overcorrected, turned, and we had several deaths. Strictly because of the energy that's involved when a high-speed train hits a car, the energy is so severe that a lot of times, as I mentioned, everything in that vehicle moves towards the principal direction of force. That force is so severe, a lot of times people are thrown clear of the vehicle. People are thrown through. You may be the driver of a car and thrown through the backside window. You may be the passenger of a car and thrown through the sunroof. Um, you, you are thrown out of that vehicle. You know, the hardest thing that I do, the hardest part of my job is to go out to that family room and tell a family that the healthy young child that left the house that day is never coming home. And that happens all too frequent, frequently at a level one trauma center. Nobody ever thinks it's going to happen to them. Nobody leaves the house that day. Nobody comes into my trauma center and says, gee, I thought today's the day I was going to die. Everybody thinks it's going to happen to somebody else. But the truth of the matter is, the statistics show it does happen. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do to prevent that. Stay tuned to see how you can avoid being a statistic. Look to live. too close. And the problem is that it happens far more often than you think. But do you know how this can be avoided? It's easier than you think. All you have to do is look for the signs. What signs? They are all over the place. Let's rewind to see how this can be avoided. When you see an advance warning sign, pay attention because you are approaching a railroad crossing. Pavement markings may also be present. This would be a good time to lower the radio, check behind you, and put your foot over the brake. See that sign? It's called a crossbuck, and it tells you to yield to trains. You might also see a yield sign at the crossing. Yield on the highway means slow down, prepare to stop, and look for traffic before going. It's the same here, just instead of a car, we're dealing with a 12 million pound train. You can avoid real disaster by simply obeying the sign. a good question. Where exactly are you supposed to stop at a railroad crossing? Stop at the white line on the pavement if a train is approaching. If no line is present, then stop no closer than the average car length, which is 15 feet from the nearest rail, or no further than 50 feet away for good sight distance. Now, let's consider how far it takes a train to stop. 
Here's John, our football player. He's pretty fast. Right, John? Okay. Get running, John. As you can see, John is running the length of an entire football field. Now, if he ran across 18 of them, John would be running one full mile. Why is that important? Well, besides us having fun trying to wear John out, this one mile number also relates to our train. At just 55 miles per hour, it takes the average train at least one mile to stop. That's 18 football fields to slow this train down from 55 miles per hour to zero. By the way, it takes John a lot less to stop. Guys, they're already at the game. Let's go. Let's go. Look, now the train's gonna make us wait. Relax, it's too slow. I'll beat the train to the crossing easy. To try to beat a train to a crossing, is the risk of being disfigured or losing your life worth the seconds you might save? One train at a crossing can often hide a second train on another track. start across the tracks, there's room on the other side to get completely across. Remember, you need a minimum of a car length, which is 15 feet from the track. So if you don't fit, don't commit. to zone out. You have to look and listen for the train. Oh, come on. Come on, start. Not again. Come on. Oh, this is so not cool. Come on. Come on, start. If you ever get stalled on the tracks, immediately leave the vehicle and call the police or the emergency number posted at the crossing. If a train is approaching, move away from the crossing so not to be hit by debris. Your vehicle can always be replaced. You can't. Okay, let me remind you what can happen if you don't exercise a little caution at a crossing and obey the signs and signals. Remember, every time you approach a railroad crossing, slow down and be prepared to stop. Here, there are no do-overs. Look, 
Listen and live.